Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist episode 91. Muhammad, how's it going? Alhamdulillah. How's it going for yourself? Alhamdulillah, pretty good. As you know, like last week, uh, we didn't do an episode. I was uh, working like, <laughs> I guess it was like five days back to back working morning till night. So uh, with the business, we just... Um, we just meet up because we work remotely. So we, we try to meet, meet up in person every three months. And because it's like, you know, it's every three months, sometimes every six months, it's very precious time. So we end up, you know, just going back to back. So I'm kind of recovering from that, but alhamdulillah. How's, uh, yeah. how's work? How's the exhaustion? I'm so tired, bro. Mm. Really sleepy. Mm. Uh, Finished the night shift yesterday, got to bed about nine this morning. Mm. And then I don't know. I could, I need to I need to have a nap after this episode, I think, because I've got another shift after this. Oh, but man. it is what it is. It is what it is. Tell me about the haircut. Oh, um just cut it myself. I guess this is how yeah. I cut my own hair. <laughs> yeah. uh, since COVID, I don't know. Since COVID came through, like I haven't gone to the barbers, and part of that is obviously they were shut for a long time. But then I realised I don't mind my hair looking like this, so I just cut it myself, save some money, easy yeah. job. Uh, so Did you have to buy a trimmer, or you already had one? Uh, I think I had one from a while ago, mm. so it just saves ten, fifteen quid, whatever it is. Is that um, how much it is? Once, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking, it's about. It depends what you want to get. But if, I think on average, it's going to be about ten pounds or more. Oh wow! Yeah, I remember when I was in London, I used to pay five, but that was uh, maybe yeah. some dodgy East London place. <laughs> yeah, either that, or maybe child prices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, I haven't been to a hairdresser probably for two years or something. So it's been you good. Right uh, my wife does. Oh, um, just try and God. do it. Wow. It's pretty quick. And, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, you know what, to be honest, because whenever, when I used to go to the barber, um, I would procrastinate, delay it. And I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I usually, I would like to cut it every like two weeks. By it, I would end up leaving it four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. And it's the same, honestly, when I cut it at home, to be honest, but it's a bit less mm. maybe. But yeah, you're yeah. right. Like it saves money. It saves, it saves time. You know, the, the barbers, like obviously they're, you know, that's their thing, right? That's their day-to-day -day thing. So they might want to spend mm. time and try and get it a certain way. I, I don't really care about that. So it's nice yeah. to just, you know, like take 15 minutes, like, 15 20 minutes maximum is done and uh yeah, exactly. no downsides really for me so are you gonna <coughs> yeah. stick with that you think this sort of cut this is what i've been getting yeah. for months now um oh. i think you've just i think every time you've we've recorded i've i've had this haircut it's just obviously grown out um but otherwise i always i've been doing i can't remember last time i had it i had yeah i must have gone to the barbers like before march mm -hmm. um because March is when like, sort of the lockdown really happened. Yeah, mm. so since before then, I haven't actually really gone to a barber's. Right, done it yeah. myself since. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was I going to say, bro? Um, damn. I, I, I guess I'm tired. <laughs> um, oh, that, that was it, bro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did, you, did you take a listen to the last episode at all? No, mm, uh, I haven't listened to any podcasts lately. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to highlight that because I, I, I think, uh, I don't know if, if it has this much of an effect, but I released the video version uh, later than I usually do in terms of time of day. And that right. video just hasn't done that well. But I think on the audio side, it's done as, as well as other ones. And I really want to encourage people to listen to it because it was really good. And it was like a proper deep dive into confidence, um, how you get confident, why some people are confident, what is confidence, and like a proper like Islamic worldview on confidence. So check that out. Mm. That's episode 90. Uh, it's really good. Um, for this episode, bro, I actually I had a topic and uh, I thought uh, it's something that, you know, Muslims, we don't really talk about it that much. Um, 
but it's worth discussing actually to see, you know, should we, should we be kind of following certain, you know, I guess parts of the world when it comes to this, should we not? And that's kind of the whole, uh, environmentalism and, and climate change thing. Right. Oh, so, yeah. um, so I, I, uh, it, it's like, a sometimes, it, you know, they call it environmentalism, right? So it's like a, yeah. an ism, it's like a movement. Right. And, uh, I guess it was even all the rage back in the 70s, 60s, probably even with the whole hippie movement. They were very much about, you know, heal the world, take care of the world and all of that. And as as the uh, effects of climate change have become more apparent, you know, there's been more and more focus on it. And you get some people like, you know, making a big deal out of it. So, you know, it's like a, it is a big deal, I suppose, you know. Um, yeah. But it's just not something that I've taken that seriously i suppose uh, really like up till maybe two three years ago i, I honestly it, it would be a, it would be a kind of a big huge exaggeration overstatement for me to say i take it seriously now right <laughs> i don't, I don't mm. think i i can say that but but yeah i just wanted to start by asking you like like us as citizens of the world as citizens of the uk or whatever as muslims like what do you think? Should we care about this? How much should we care? Um, you know, what's your take? So personally, it affects me quite a lot. Um, I think about it a lot and I, I don't know where it sits, Islamically speaking. Like I know that we are, you know, khulafa on the earth and we should look after the earth, etc. In terms of rulings and stuff, I don't know where it sits. However, the same guilt I feel for not, like recycling or being actively aware or doing something that's contrary to looking after the environment, that same guilt is the same guilt I feel when I like commit a sin. Like mm. that's the same way it has in my heart. Mm. Um, so like, I don't know, it could be something as like, especially since I've, you know, I've exposed myself to a lot of media and content regarding this. Like I hate, like us. okay, yesterday, for example, I was at work and um, I was really thirsty I'd say yesterday, early hours of this morning, I was really, really thirsty. And I went to get, you know, water from the, the dispenser that we've got at work. Mm. However, they have, I didn't have a bottle with me and they had disposable cups and I obviously used it. And then I had to throw that cup away. And I was so annoyed yeah. that I had to throw that away after one use that I mm. like, I just felt really guilty for such a long mm. time afterwards. Cause mm. I don't usually do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually I go to the kitchen, get a glass of water, but because of where I was at work, I couldn't find one. Yeah. Um, little things like that. And recently I've been, uh, I watched a documentary about plastic um, not too long ago and how it's so prevalent in the ocean right now that like you could get, like you get a cup of seawater, for example, and they'll look at it under the microscope and the mm. amount of plastic that's in there, you know, is insane compared to the vastness of the ocean to yeah. the point that every single, I think it was like almost, or even maybe definitely every single fish that they catch and they examine has plastics in it, microplastics. Yeah. Um, so plastic that is from different sort of, you know, origins that then breaks down to pieces, but mm -hmm. the smallest it gets is, and a lot of it, that's why like you're getting like wildlife that just washes up and dies that we don't know the effects that that has on us. Like they were looking at the, the same documentary or another documentary I watched even looked at like human bodies and, and, found plastic that's just sitting in our bodies because of what we've eaten um stuff like that we don't know what the effects are mm -hmm. and i feel so guilty that i'm part of that problem i mean mm -hmm. I, I i plastic is a, my, i know I'm focusing on plastic here but i think that's just the most recent thing i've done i've looked into but plastic is such a phenomenal and versatile sort of resource that we've sort of come up with but it's the the biggest thing is like how our disposability sort of thing about it. Like, you know, you can buy something made out of plastic and it will last you like 50 years or whatever. That's perfectly fine. But we, we, we've got stuff that we just use for like a moment. We use for a few seconds and then that's it. It goes like disposable cutlery, disposable plates, disposable this, disposable that. It's a disposable culture that I, I think we need to turn the dial back on. I think, it, I, I think it's not just, I can't speak from a like Islamic ruling perspective. I just don't know. However, if I've got it in my head that I'm 
what I do leads to some negative consequence, whether that's to a human being somewhere in the world or that's to some sort of wildlife or something. And I'm actively like thinking, I actively know that me, you know, disposing of this or being negligent about it is part of a problem. Then I can't, it just doesn't sit with me. I, I feel absolutely responsible. Um, yeah. But I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I'm the same, bro. Like, it's only logical, right? Like you're saying, mm. if you're going to harm, if you're going to harm uh, uh, other creatures or like animals or yourself or your potentially your grandchildren or, you know, other humans, then it's, it's obvious, right, uh, that we should take that seriously. For me, bro, it's like from an Islamic point of view, I think it's very obvious, right? Um, like I just, uh, the, the, the ayat that always come to mind in, with this topic is from Surah Al-Rahman right at the beginning. Allah says, A'udhu Billah Min Shajim, when Najmu wa Shajur Yasjudan, okay, so he's describing all the different amazing things that he created. Uh, and he says, Wa Sama Arafaha wa Wada Al Mizan. And he raised the, the skies of the heaven and uh, imposed the balance, okay, Al Mizan. Uh, mm. And this is, the, this is the big thing for me. The obvious thing is that there is a balance, right? And when with all yeah. the climate, whether it's climate change or whether it's purely just polluting and filling the earth with with uh you know waste that is not going to like go away that's obviously messing with the balance of things right because yeah. you know the ocean had a balance of uh salty water and and non-salty water of cold water warm water water uh, different fish this and that so there's a balance and then we put plastics in it to the point where every you know fish has plastic in it we've obviously messed with the with the balance with the mizan and then straight yeah. after that ayah, Allah says, "Alla tatraw fil mizan." Do not transgress with the balance. Don't, uh, you know, pass the bounds with the balance. Wa aqimul wazna bil qisti wa la tuxirul mizan. And establish weight in justice and do not make deficient the balance. So for me, bro, it's very, 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 very clear that we have to uh, look at it at, as a balance thing. Like Allah created everything with a balance. And we have to keep up that balance, right? And mm. it, it, it even goes back to hundreds of years ago. If you're cutting the trees down and all the trees are going, it's kind of obvious that you're not going to stay within balance in that way, yeah. right? So yeah. it's very obvious to me. Uh, we should take it seriously. I don't know personally how seriously we, we should take it because obviously we've got so many different issues out here. And uh, sometimes I do get the feeling in my head that... Uh, like if we rectified ourselves internally, then it's something that Allah can just fix, you know, just like yeah. that. But, yeah. um, but I think but it's yeah, part that, of that rectification sure. process. I think like the, the, the fact that I think that the, the, if you, obviously there are priorities, right. And the top of it is like worshiping Allah with no partners, you know, that's like the top. Right. But I think, uh, things like this, um, are telling of what, is in our hearts in terms of the dunya. So mm. like the dispose of like our, our uh, apathy of, you know, dispose towards disposing things. Like we don't really care about disposing things shows that we are very materialistic in the sense that we just, we're constantly purchasing constantly. Like, mm. you know, it's just going in, in, in one door and out the bin sort of thing. Um, and I think that's telling of what our, the condition of our hearts are. Um, because if you, if you were content with what you had and you could see, you could see where money could be spent elsewhere and you could see ways of avoiding that sort of stuff, then that's fine. Um, but also when it comes to this, I feel like there's still loads of work that needs to be done by people in power and, you know, governments and stuff because they, the, there's not enough to facilitate or to even impose that we take care of the environment better. Um, one example for is like, so after I really exposed myself to this sort of content, I was like, okay, I'm going to actively try and recycle every single bit of plastic I, ha I have to get. And I'm going to try and avoid purchasing it in the first place. Yeah. So um, I don't know if it's because of COVID, but I feel like there's way less, at least we don't have open markets here like we do in London. Um, so you have to go to the supermarket to get your stuff, generally speaking. But I feel like there's way more packaging on veg, fruit and vegetables than there used to be um, before COVID. And I don't know if that's oh, because yeah. they want to avoid people touching stuff. Um, yeah. Because a lot of the free fruit and veg that I used to get doesn't seem to be there anymore. Anyway, mm. regardless, I think I've seen it now, but, but there was a period where it wasn't there. Anyway, so 
a lot of the packaging, a lot of like fruit and veg, you know, berries, whatever, they come in these plastic sort of container containers. And I'm like, okay, sweet, plastic, that's fine, whatever. Um, I will literally because usually what it says on our recycling here locally, it says you can recycle like plastic bottles, you can recycle uh, like tin cans, aluminium cans, uh, cardboard, paper, that sort of thing. So those are like the, the, the normal stuff that is recycled by the council. So I started getting, we always, we always have like a two big bag for lives that we just put loads of recyclable material in. So I know I'm, this story is very long, but uh, so I've started putting all this packaging in there, plastic packaging, and I drive it down to uh, these like communal bin things that we've got yeah. in the park about five minutes away. Anyway, I do that. I've been doing that for ages. The other day I was doing, I went to do it and the recycling people were there collecting everything. So they're like tipping the bin into like the, the, the truck. And then I've got bags. I'm like, oh, here, put it in here. So I start pouring it into the bags. He goes, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? I was like, I'm pouring all this plastic in here. And he's like, oh, you can't recycle that. I was like, why? It's, it's plastic. Mm. He goes, no, you can only recycle bottles, etc. All wow. of this stuff isn't, doesn't get recycled here in the sea. I was like, well, what am I meant to do with all of this then? It says on it that it can be recycled. He goes, well, yeah. you'll have to go to London because only London like, support that kind of thing. <laughs> wow. I was like, well, this is a waste. And you've been so, doing that for like months. Yeah, I've been dumping it in there because I considered it. It says yeah, it's yeah. On, on the packaging. It says recyclable. So I stick yeah. it in there thinking, mm. what's the difference between a bottle and this? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I've, I, I still do it, by the way, regardless. Mm -hmm. I've still been – because I actively feel like I need to do as much as I can because the guilt of me throwing plastic in the refuse bin – it just winds me up because I yeah. just, all I can do, all I envision is that going now into, cause I live in front of the ocean anyway. Right. Like the sea is literally five, 10 seconds walk in front of our, our road. So I'm like, I actively am aware that this is going to end up there. If I don't try and do my, might as well just it. throw it off the um, cliff, bro. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Bro. Um, and it, it really winds me up that like, I can't go any further than I want to. Mm. Then I then, then this limit here. So it's like, well, why have they limited that? Why not? You know, it's these are these are infrastructures that exist that can really benefit, even financially. Where I was watching like the financial benefits of recycling, mm. where like people collect like in, there's a third world countries where people collect plastics and tins and all sorts of stuff and actually sell it to the people that are recycling because the recycling organisations or companies or whatever can then manufacture goods out of that and sell yeah. it. You know, whether that's like plastic sheets yeah. or whether that's like, you know, aluminium or paper or cardboard, mm. etc. So there is, so there is monetary like gain there. Materials for free. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know why that isn't capitalized upon. However, there is scandals going on. And I don't know if you're aware or if the listeners are aware, but like loads and loads of our recycled, you know, our recycled stuff gets exported. Our waste gets exported on ships. That's something that I never knew about. So like mm. they will load up ships, like the UK will load up ships with, uh, with plastic, with like recyclable material that will get sent to like, uh, where was it recently? I think it was like Malaysia or somewhere, right? That just gets stacked. It just gets stacked up, piled up, piled up, piled up. They either, Malaysia will, for example, won't, will either have too much that they can't cope with it or like 90% of the stuff they're getting sent isn't, um, isn't what's the word, isn't recyclable, isn't applicable or whatever. Mm. So you've got all of these like first world countries that are exporting all of their waste to other countries yeah. and dumping yeah. them there. They're suffering. And then you basically, all you've got is just a revolving door mm. of ships that are just carrying waste around the world. So we've got landfills where we're just throwing waste into like holes in the ground. And then we've got quote unquote recyclable stuff that is just, you know, uh, uh, just traveling around the world, like in circles and actually not, nothing's being done with it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of experts that consider that, you know, we're way past the point of rectifying this now. Like the damage is, is so far done. I mean, think about it, but think about, think about all the things that you've got in your house right now mm. that are made with plastic and then times up with how many times you see it stocked up fully in the shelves. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. And then times that by how many stores there are in the world. And the, you can just visualize how much yeah. of this is getting wasted, how much is this constantly getting manufactured. Like yeah. plastic products range from just packaging to toys to food to everything. Bro. And it's constantly just being produced. Mm. Um, rarely any of it is being 
is from recycled materials. So we're literally just pumping this sort of stuff into the world yeah, constantly. Yeah. The I mean, only solution I can think of is like we start loading it into rockets and blasting it off into space, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like, um, obviously, the things are complicated, like, in the world, right? So sometimes we might think, like, for example, uh, our plastic waste, a company could use that to manufacture goods, and so it's like free materials for them. But the complication yep. maybe is that they have to pay to collect it and then to get it mm -hmm. to them. And so there is, they need to invest in order for that to be possible. So there is that, yeah. that's just one example. So the, there is, I feel like there's always these kind of, excuses or reasons for it um but but i feel like there are just like you're saying there are some areas that are just so obvious and relatively you know cheap and you know i'd be fully on board like for example uh like you're saying on the, in the shops bro imagine over here over here um i have to explain almost every time that i'm using this like reusable bag like because um, over here, uh, you, generally, you don't pack your own bags, right? People will pack it for they you. Do. Okay. Um, and so I have to explain every time, like, put it in the bag, right? Then they'll be yeah. like, oh, okay, right. So then they try and fit everything in one bag, right? Because they, yeah. they, they're just, because not used to it, right? They're like, like, okay, so it specifically has to go in this bag. So even though if this bag is overflowing, I have to try and fit everything in yeah, the yeah. bag, right? Yeah. So that's an example of uh, just, no one's used to it. No one ever sees somebody using a reusable bag. That's like probably the one like concrete thing that I do to avoid waste, right? But right. then what, when I'm buying like vegetables, for example, you have to weigh them. To weigh them, you have to put mm. them in the plastic bags, right? Mm. So every week, imagine I'm probably using seven or eight of these plastic bags. And what happens when I get them from the shop to my home? I'm just getting rid of them. Like I, yeah. I, 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 I store them, uh, some of them because we use them again, yeah. but most of the time, like those are just piling up anyway. We don't need have much use for them. Yeah. So that's yeah. like really uh, annoying. And I, 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 I didn't, I didn't think of any way to avoid this, but every week it's like, what the hell? I even start trying to put all different vegetables in one bag and then the guy weighs them separately and then puts them in one bag, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I try to do that, but the, 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 it's it's just long because the guy's like, well, why? the guy, what he does is, he'd be like, okay, you've got, for example, bananas and you've got an avocado. He'll take the avocado out and he'll get another bag and he put it in for, for me. He, he yeah, like, he's yeah, like yeah. thinking he's doing a favor for me. So it's it's uh, people don't understand and it's hard for me to imagine the barriers here to actually doing the right thing. And yeah. then I found this out. I found out that you can buy like these kind of bags, like for vegetables that are reusable online. Yep. So I'm, I'm probably going to buy those, but they said that the, you know, the stickers for the weight and the price and barcode and all that don't stick to them well. So <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah. Man. And yeah. this is what I was saying is this should be uh, our first point of call, right? Um, even, um, you know, like you're saying, like you might get a, a little mini carton box thing of whatever uh, peaches, right? Um, right. that there's no reason that should, that can't be in that like recycle, recycled, uh, cardboard kind of material. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like surely yeah. we can do these kind of basic things, man. Yeah. I mean, um, what, what I, what I'm of the opinion of is that a lot of countries, developing countries, especially like North Africa are in prime position for them for, to take lead in these kind of things. Like I'm well aware <laughs> that years ago, Morocco banned plastic bags, oh. um, and like the difference was crazy bro like you used to, like you you know you've been to obviously been north africa many times and you've seen just plastic waste just everywhere in it's the part of the landscape like bro yeah it's part of the landscape right however like yeah. a few years after they ban came in in morocco yeah. like you just don't see that anymore it's really wow. quite phenomenal the goats you, you know, especially plastic up. well this is it <laughs> but it, but but what i'm saying is like when you when you look at countries like you've got third world countries which are quite poor and, 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 mm. and have a lot of difficulties you've got first world countries which are like very way too indulged in, in in consumerism anyway and then you've got this middle ground of like developing countries what you'd call now developing countries are i believe in this prime position mm. to take the lead when it comes to renewables when not it comes to go to green down energy. the indulgent path yeah because because they're not the population isn't too far gone you know a lot of the population are from you, you know especially like in rural areas which is the majority of that country is rural mm. uh you know, you know it's only cities that have that that are 
packed out, but majority is spread out on rural areas. But a lot of the people that live there are well aware of reusable lifestyles because it's not that long ago. Yeah, the old that, way. Yeah. Yeah, the old way. It's not that long ago. So it's prime, prime positioning. Yeah. Um, and this is why I think that a lot of the countries have taken it on board. They're also taking it on board because they are some of the countries that are most that will be you know, theoretically most affected by global warming and climate change and stuff. Like Pakistan, for example, I was reading, uh, I've got a project to plant like millions and millions of trees um, because projections show that they will be the most devastated by climate change. Oh. If, you know, do you, do you understand? So there is this yeah. like sort of positive for them to also get involved in that mm. as well. Um, and I think we're like, this is like one, this is one of the things that is prime time for us. Like, okay, I think if there was never a, a decline of the Muslim sort of civilization Muslim empire I think we would have been powerhouses leading this through anyway because it's in our mindset in the same way like in the Ottoman the Ottomans were you know looking after you know, like that they built within their cities and infrastructure they built ways of looking after animals you know mm -hmm. like they had um, like what was it like fountains little things that were built in in structures in cities to benefit like wild animals and stray cats and all that sort of stuff mm. like that would have been integrated within it as well as soon as Muslims would have been aware of the impact that you know having on the environment yeah. I think that, that would have that would have come naturally mm. Mm -hmm. um i think green energy uh renewable energy you know recycling all of these things that actually if you look at it now like that's where some of the money the the, the, the growth is looking like it's going to head in the future i mean look at for example like you know electric cars now like the race to to get the electric car going the stock prices all of that sort of, like the race for that is crazy um but you're you're gonna you I think it's like prime time to you know for, for Muslim countries that are somewhat disadvantaged to jump on this because this is the future that it's very difficult for first world countries to back to backpedal on. Mm. Um, yeah, I suppose. for example, like yeah. we're still developing. This is the thing. Like if you look, so I think uh, it came out yesterday in the government about twenty. They're, they're predicting or they're trying to enforce like in twenty thirty or twenty thirty five. They basically want to aim for zero uh, fossil fuel cars, right? And I think here in the UK, oh. I think that's what I read yesterday. But I think that's digging deeper. I think that basically means they don't want to be selling any new fossil ones. Fuel car, new ones, basically, um, which is all fine and dandy. But there's no infrastructure to charge to charge all these cars that are on the going to be on the streets if we're not owning our own homes and we live, you know, like I live in a flat and where am I going to charge it and all this sort of stuff. Um, however, with developing countries, especially wider out, you've got, they're still building, like they're still, they're not as established possibly as, yeah, as other right. places. Yeah. Um, but that's once again, me thinking rural, I'm not thinking within the cities where there isn't that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. I think the, these countries like, so-called less developed countries I, I always really don't really like those words because um really it, muslim countries are the most developed right because they're mm -hmm. the countries where people have the correct uh they're in line with their fitra so they're most developed in terms of their belief in allah but yes economically developed you could say or economically mature um sometimes these countries like you're saying like algeria for example Algeria is one of those countries, not like dead, dead poor, right? There's like a pretty big middle class, but yeah. obviously it's, uh, you could say behind in many ways, right? Um, now, sometimes these are the countries though that are, are really struggling the most where um, the education and the culture is not there around uh, yeah. waste, around littering, <laughs> around pollution. So that's not there. Um, and also, it's hard to, because if you're going to stop using plastics, plastic bags, for example, um, then you, and you move to other materials, it might cost you an extra 10, 20%, right? Yeah. Those things. And these populations like in Algeria, for example, they're more sensitive to that added cost of 10 or 20%. So in some ways, uh, it might be harder for poorer countries uh, to make these changes, right? Um, yeah. Uh, if you think as well of like, I mean, some of these countries, bro, they're, they're hardly functioning, right? Or yeah. they're hardly functioning. So, uh, but I do see what you mean in terms of there's green 
greenfield that you know what they call greenfield areas where it's like untouched and this yeah. is like prime areas where development can happen and if that de ha development can happen in a good sustainable balanced way then that's good you don't have to yeah, yeah. you don't have to pull something down to start yeah in a good way and, yeah and it's a mentality like my biggest i think the biggest uh advantage we've got is that people's mentalities aren't too far gone in that sense i think here like you know america the uk europe um even, you know, I, I suppose even the UAE, I, I guess. Anywhere where there's, like, people that have lived comfortable, wealthy lives, yeah, they are way too far gone in terms of mm. ever trying to live any any differently. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just part and parcel of life, the way mm -hmm. things are. Mm. And you would imagine, like, the culture in the UK, for example, versus China. Uh, the, the culture in the UK, just as a general thing, is more individualistic, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's all about fo the focus on the self and the pleasure of the self. Whereas uh, China, they have more of a communal um, philosophy or attitude. Yeah. And so you can imagine that Chinese would be more likely to jump on this uh, movement, if you like, um, if they were convinced it's for the good of the community, good of the mm -hmm. country. They'd be probably more likely because that's, that's what they've kind of been brought up on, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the culture will, will play a role as well. Um, but I'm just thinking, bro, like, personally, I don't have, obviously, I'm, I'm in a good position, alhamdulillah, relative to most people. But I, I would definitely pay extra 10, 20% if things are going to start being uh, made with uh, wood or with cardboard or with, you know, these yeah. kind of things. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, yeah. it's like, for example, the, the webcam that I'm using now that I got recently, if I had to pay an extra 20% for it, for me, at least, that would mean maybe waiting a little longer, like wait a month or two before I get it. Like, and inshallah, I'm going to use it for years. So in the bigger picture of things is like, doesn't make a difference. I think it's for the, for the people who are less, um, you know, advantaged that it hurts, you know, for, to charge an extra 10, 20%. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the, the barrier here. I, I think the incorporating positive, uh, you know, charitable works within everyday prices of things is, it's really cool. Like, I think that's a really cool idea uh, for every company to get involved in, even like if it's just a PR thing, as long as there is a positive outcome in the end. You mean like uh, giving a percentage of... Yeah, so to... like, you see like, uh, you see a lot with like fair trade chocolate and stuff like that. Like you buy chocolate and it's like got a fair trade symbol and you, you read what that's about. And it's about them setting up projects for like cocoa farmers and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. if you're actively, you know, like, Oh, I will buy this one because the intention is that it will benefit some people in the long run, but it might yeah. be a bit more pricier, but that yeah. that's wholesome to me. Like, I think that's really cool. And I think if every sort of company that produced anything had that, um, like I, I remember even when I had pure XI, there was like a refugee crisis at one point and I thought, okay, a uh, portion of every single sale is going to go towards this and that. But like people were buying clothes based on that. Um, clothes is a whole other thing though. Like, you know, fast fashion is mm. destroyed, you know, not just destroying environments, but destroying cultures. Like, you know, if you look at like uh, even Algeria, for example, look at Algeria a hundred of years ago, like you see the old footage of what people used to wear and yeah. there was traditions and there was, you know, all this sort of stuff. Mm. But now fast fashion, cheap fashion, clothes from China that have just been worn a few times and then put in the recycling bins or, you know, chucked or whatever. And now it's, suddenly everybody's dress codes changed mm. and, and the culture's dead and there's nothing left yeah. of it. And yeah. that's, oh, it's so sad to me. Like, yeah. you know, you go to, so for example, my wife, when, when I married a wife and um, I spoke to her about Tunisia and stuff, said you know we've got socks and stuff right now her perspective of socks you know clothing wise is like traditional clothing because that's mm. i think where she was from in algeria that's what she was used to but my um my perception of what a sock was based on where i live in tunisia is like it's all chinese goods <laughs> yeah like I've honestly so that, yeah. yeah so like the the local tuesday sock or whatever where i live in tunisia is like everything is straight from china like uh especially clothes bro all the clothes are like like proper proper cheap sort of western sort of clothing like mm. jeans fake Nike, like fake yeah fake this guns. fake that just yeah. absolutely everywhere bro and then i'm just 
it's really sad because the culture has been absolutely murdered and done away with. Like there's nothing left of, yeah. of any sort of traditional culture or anything that has yeah. got some skill put into it. Mm. Um, it's really quite sad, man. Mm. And, and there's nothing left for us. Like there's nothing left that says, Oh, mm. this is who we are. This is individuals. And the thing mm. is, yeah, this is part of globalization. This is part of like the industrialization mm. and mass production and societies. Um, but it all goes back to this overconsumption, bro. And it's not just, it's not just, like the effects, actually, you read, you read about the end times, you read, you know, ayat in the Quran about the fitna and facade that's going to spread in, across the land. And I feel like this is it, like the overconsumption, the, the constant indulgence in the dunya is it, its ill effects are now visible to see. Like, you know, they speak about like coronavirus, for example. One of the strongest theories about why this virus has come about is because of, um, bringing in things from all sorts of animals for example in this market specifically in china from all sorts of sort of habitats all together under one roof because it was uh you know mass consumption people just had no limits to what they wanted suddenly you've got like this animal that would never come in contact with this animal both being slaughtered in the same place both being consumed by the same people um you've got monocultures of of you know uh battery farming for example like they were talking about swine flu. Why swine? Why was swine flu come about and it was so deadly? Well, if you think about pigs, or any animal really, but pigs for this example, you've got like hundreds or thousands of pigs in one sort of location, right? One farm, all tightly packed together, etc. Now, to avoid illnesses and stuff, they pump all of these animals with antibiotics, all right? So in this in this farm, and then what happens is, yeah, fair enough, it's killing all this in diseases and infection but because of mutation you get one one sort of mutation in that bacteria or that you know virus whatever that is resistant to what we're yeah. pumping it with but then because they're all so tightly packed mm. that resistant strain suddenly spreads like wildfire mm. that is right game over yep and then if you've got that packed with those of other animals it transfers to different animals mm. and then before you know it it's usually a, as far as I've read, it's the transfer from one animal to another, which makes it easier to transfer to humans, I believe. Um, anyway, so that's, you know, that's the dangers of battery farming uh, and overconsumption and, and, you know, basically trying to have Jenna on earth by getting whatever you want, whenever you want it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got another theory, active theory they're thinking about, which is affecting this is like deforestation. So you've mm -hmm. got, you've got habitats that have been locked away from, from you know humans for thousands and thousands of years within those habitats you've got wildlife that has you know all wildlife passes viruses and diseases amongst themselves but you but they're locked away within these habitats like rainforests for example like the amazon but because of continuous deforestation you are encroaching upon areas that humans haven't encroached upon which then exposes them to diseases and illnesses that have, they haven't been exposed to in thousands of years and then but the theory is these coronaviruses, these all these all these viruses that are turning up, are because we are putting ourselves in situations, habitats, um, you know, uh, mixing things together that haven't been mixed ever before or haven't been in contact with for thousands of years. That we are basically not biologically ready for them because we haven't built up that sort of resistance, um, and it all goes back down to overconsumption, to basically wanting everything and anything now, like on demand, everything, like. I don't know how, I don't know if we'll ever get back to, you know, eating things that are within season, uh, looking after our own, like, look at, look at, we, you know, we speak about the episodes we did with Sharif so many times, but that is the nature of man. Like that is the, the in my eyes, that's the fitra. That's what we should be aiming towards. Like that's the balanced approach. You know, you eat what's in season, you eat mm. what's available, you raise your own wild, you know, you, there is no excess there. There is mm. no, uh, gluttony there is no uh constant need of gra of instant gratification with you know food and all of this stuff but so is it balance, is it our fault then like because i couldn't tell you what the season of x y and z is um, so that's because we aren't engaged in that process like my my parents are very they're quite they're very aware of what's in season what isn't because they um they spent many, many, many years like uh, growing fruit and veg for work. So they used mm. to, they used to work in horticulture, um, stuff like that. And I was, I was born like 
um, in like a, a, a well, I was born in like I was born in in this sort of like greenhouse complex thing up in Essex. So it is they're growing all sorts of fruit and veg and stuff, right? And that's what my parents did for a living. Um, so they used to grow fruit and veg in their garden as well, like for personal use and stuff like that. Mm. And it was ve- they were very aware of what what's in season, what isn't. And like in Tunisia, we've got a very large garden, alhamdulillah. And it's just full of all sorts of fruit and veg and stuff. And because of that, they know what's in season. Oh, like you, I'll ask my dad, oh, what tree is this? He'll be like, it's an orange tree. Oh, how come there's no oranges? Oh, because it's not in season until this and this day. And he's very aware. Like my dad is like an mm. expert with this sort of stuff. Very aware yeah. of what's in season, what isn't. He, like when he used to live in Tunisia, because he's here now, he used, you know, if I tell him I'm coming, he'd be like, oh, wait a month or whatever, because then the oranges will be in season or the lemons yeah. will be in season or the grapes will be in season. Like he'll always be... Or like I will come when I come and visit him, he'll be like, Oh, it's a shame you literally just missed pomegranate season. Like we just had pomegranate yeah, yeah, yeah. So like people are very aware, especially where where I live, they're very aware because this stuff isn't this stuff is seasonal and it's like you look forward to certain months because you know you're gonna be able to eat this particular thing. And yeah. it always tastes better that way because it's it's natural, you know, it's not flown halfway mm. across the world in like a mm. in a in a on a plane, etc. So, but here, bro, like, we don't know that because whatever you want, you get, you know? And mm. I, 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 this is a complete guess, but there might be, there might be something to it. But I believe, like, okay, we are humans made of the Torah of the earth, right? I believe, like, there are certain uh, health benefits to eating that which is in season, you know? Like, I, yeah, I think that could be, yeah. there's a combination of factors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in this cycle for a reason you know everything is measured for a reason like you know a few weeks out of this month then this is no longer bears fruit you know mm. but then also like there's certain weather conditions and there's certain the amount of light that we get and what kind of vitamin we need and all, all of this stuff i think actually it's all holistic with our wants and desires bro and try and break the rules and in the mm. long term we see the negatives whether that's health negatives whether that's uh polluting the environment uh, um, carbon footprint actually it's you know anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually so but, but what, what i was saying bro is that to be honest with you, what you're saying about seasonality is I could have done that homework and then I could go to the shop and only buy what's in season. Now, that might not really make any sense in this country because 90% of stuff is imported in this country anyway. But, um, yeah. you know, just as a general practice, like there is stuff we can do even if it's not being made easy for us, right? There is, you know, there is that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, I also feel like, bro, there's like two different elements to, to this uh, lack of balance, right? There is littering and pollution, which is what we've been focusing on. And right. that one seems like a bit maybe easier to combat in terms of just not wasting so much. And it comes very natural to me. I don't know why. I just naturally, I feel like I hate waste. So I just like efficiency. So if I see waste, I just really try to avoid it. But then there's the other part of it, which is pollution. Um, you know, and so that's something that I feel like I haven't really done anything to combat. Like, obviously, I have a car. Yeah. I drive the car as much as I like. Um, I, I fly wherever I can afford and whenever, whatever. So, you know, do you do anything about that? Do you have like a decent understanding of like what we could even do on that side i think i think th- this is something that sits more with uh local authority governments to sort of put in um because i think it, at that point it hits a level that you know it's difficult for us to like the technology is there now you know where it comes to electric cars and stuff like that so if there was some sort of project that they were initiated where you know, you trade your old car in, you get some sort of discount on, on an electric car, whatever it is. And that's all. Yeah, I'd be up for that totally. Um, mm. Because I think there are certain things that I think now have become necessities. Like, for example, I can't get to where I need to go um, when it comes to my family and stuff. Right. If I need to go and see my in-laws in London or whatever, like we're very interconnected now. I can't just 
it's very difficult to get from here to get to the train station locally to get from this train to another train to another tra like with anyway the practicality is with quite difficult stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really quite difficult um like tr trying to carry a push chair and a three-year-old up those flights of stairs in the subway up in london anyway i know it's minor but but the technology is there what i'm saying is the technology now exists that we could hypothetically let's say the economy was incredible and we had all the money in the world we could literally do away with all cars everybody gets a free electric car boom problem solved kind of thing you know they're getting to a point now where wind farms are producing excess energy that they can sell like they are now profitable in a sense instead of having to catch up like you're having some organizations that are gone years now without actually using fossil fuels because renewable energy is at that point like the technology is there um but bro but, you know when it comes to electric cars like how are people charging these cars uh isn't it from the energy created from coal natural gas oil no, so a lot of it can be now that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say like mm. the renewable energy now exists whether that's solar power whether yeah. that's um, it exists you know, wind but the capacity exists. is not enough um, like there's a very high chance if you're charging your electric car you'll be using fossil fuels for that energy no but they, they, they I think I believe the the technology exists where that can be integrated into the grid like we've yeah. got a wind farm out on the ocean yeah. opposite my house like mm. you see it every day and apparently like they're getting to the point where they're producing so much excess energy that they have to sell it off to people. Um, uh, and solar panels as well, like the technology is there. Like look at, for example, what Tesla's doing by selling solar panels to people. You can get solar panels on your own roofs, yeah. right? Which then charges your batteries in turn. And I mean, Sharif was talking about solar panels, how he's got yeah. two battery packs, charges them, et cetera. Like it's, it's, I suppose it's probably even possible hypothetically that yeah. you could get cars with solar panels on the roofs and then it's just mm. loading up batteries within the car itself. Mm. I'm sure that's something, you know, it might not be aesthetically pleasing, but I'm sure that's something that can be done. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think the technology to, doesn't exist. I went to Germany uh, in the South of Germany, you know, maybe people think of Germany as like a snowy cold country, but in the South of Germany, it's actually quite got a lot of sun, um, uh -huh. you know, especially for, for, you know, six months of the year or whatever. So yeah. over there, especially in one region, Black Forest region, like every house has solar panels. If you don't, it's like you're the, you'll be like, everyone will be pointing and laughing at you if you don't have solar panels, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there was also a, I, I don't know if it was a farm or just someone's house. They had this big tank underground of like manure and this manure, they put it in there and it, as it breaks down, it creates methane and then they can burn the methane for energy and stuff. Yeah. So, um, so that part, especially of Germany, like they're very, very much into these, uh, you know, renewable energy sources. Mm. So you're right, bro. Like the, the technology is there if we can adopt it. I think uh, just in terms of the economics of it and all that, yeah, it's, it's, it's that's just the only barrier an, maybe. Yeah. It needs an infrastructural push from governments mm. to do it. I know I like think. one of the obvious things that people might think of is putting solar panels in the desert, right? The problem with that is um, they get covered with sand and dust. And so they haven't yet found a solution for removing that um, dust from it, right? Like there was one thing of trying to create an, a whole new material which stops uh, grains of sand sticking to the surface. And so yeah. whenever dust would get on it, it will slide off. I know they I think they're developing that in uh, Mustar City in uh, you, Abu Dhabi and stuff. They've got one in Morocco. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, I've just looked it up now. It's called Big the Solar North Power Project. Station. Oh. Yeah, it's massive. I don't know if you can see that photo. Can you see that photo? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those are all solar panels uh, in Morocco. I don't know. Oh, they're angled in a particular way. I think this is the one that originally was supposed to be in uh, Algeria, and then uh, you know, typical Algeria. Just uh, I don't know. They wanted bribes or something like that, and so they're like, whatever. We'll go to Morocco. <laughs> um, Hamad, you've gone muted for some reason. Oh, okay. Now you're back. Oh, that was weird. Yeah. What did um, you say? Yeah, it's got like oh, there you go. Satellite image of it all. Yeah, it looks um, big. It's massive, bro. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is what I mean when I say, like, we've got prime. We've got sun, bro. Like, mm. you know what I mean? This is what I'm trying to say. Like, in terms of, we are in top position to take this on. Like, the future of energy could literally just be sit. I mean, we have we had oil anyway. You know. But this is a, a position, this is a point where we can actually take 
charge of it instead of yes, having some sort yeah. of imposing. Like if this is going to be a leading part of the world economy in 50 years, yeah. then it's an opportunity to, to be the exactly. leaders in it. Yeah, you're right. Because not only are they, they can, they can produce energy that, that, that funds themselves, right? And that becomes part of the infrastructure. So we have, you know, we start off with electric cars. We start off with solar panels. Yeah. We start off, like where, where I live in the village, bro, in the village, mm. there's so many houses now getting solar panels mm. in the village, man, because they just think, oh, why should I be paying for electricity when I can make my own? Yeah. And just save money. It's like a one and that's what they do. Like my dad, we'll my dad's been going on trying to get solar panels in our house in Tunisia for so long now that, I mean, I could probably go and just get it sorted out. Do you know what I mean? And that'll be it. We won't have to pay no electricity bill anymore because yeah. you get so much sunlight there. And yeah. then they're producing so much that they can sell the rest of the energy somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so it's money, bro. It's like, and I think subhanAllah, I think the most phenomenal thing is let's not forget everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the blessing that we've had this sun, like, you know, we've been orbiting the sun for Lord only knows how long. And it's and now suddenly there's even more benefit that's given us. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. for how many th thousands of years were the the Bedouins walking up across the sand, unbeknownst to them that they had oil underneath their feet that was actually going to become something in the future. Like, there's so many things, Subhanallah, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has created, and it isn't until a specific point in time yeah. that even more benefit is derived from it. Yeah, you yeah. know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala just keeps giving. You know, the blessings keep keep coming yeah. um this is it bro i think it's phenomenal i think it's absolutely yeah. man boosting and, and, and this is how um sometimes allah can give, give you victory through these kind of means you know mm -hmm. like if you've got some unique advantage in terms of uh energy resources you know yeah uh, like <laughs> this is a uh, you know obviously it could have been but it wasn't is that so much of the world's oil is in muslim countries yeah that, especially the high quality oil is that we could have used that as a leverage point in negotiations yeah. and obviously you know that that was a flop in the end but uh it was used uh when was it i think in the 70s um i think it was king faisal in saudi arabia he used the uh, the oil as a leverage point. as a leverage stopped, point yeah they stopped yeah. exporting it so that's an example of what could have been done now that's just saudi arabia right but what if it was saudi arabia and iraq and uh I don't know, Qatar has loads of gas and uh, Algeria and, and, and like, what if that was a kind of response to whatever, yeah. whatever, yeah, issue? Yeah, yeah. you know, so Allah gives us these opportunities. Now, uh, Turkey announced a couple of weeks ago that they found huge um, natural gas reserves in the Black Sea, I believe. So again, that's something that, you know, we never knew it was there and now it's there. And, you know, they're saying that they're expecting to, uh, you know, start producing that eventually and then they'll be self-sufficient energy-wise. Now, that's a huge deal, bro, because like uh, I know Japan and China, you know, they've always struggled with this, with the huge energy bills, importing oil, being dependent on certain countries for oil. But what if, yeah. you know, that was just a huge bill taken off your budget, you know? Definitely. It, it could be a big deal. So... Definitely, bro. Yeah, man. But I guess... um yeah, bro, the, the, the whole area of like having a car, driving a car, I've never questioned it. Like in, um, over here, the, yeah, I mean, there is no public transport hardly, I mean, it's very difficult. I know, I know some people make it work and I could make it work. Uh, it would, you know, be significantly you know, more difficult, but, um, but that is something you know, I need to, to consider maybe if I was in another country, perhaps. Like in the UK, especially London, like I almost feel like there's no reason to have a car in London. Mm. I know, Yanni, a journey might take an hour and 20 instead of like 45 minutes. That, that is possible, but I don't know, bro. I always try and put, take responsibility, mm. right? And like if we're waiting for the, the governments are not agreeing, the governments are thinking of the short term uh, situation, obviously, because imagine yeah. they. Imagine they uh, increase fuel prices, for example, by twenty percent in order to uh, in order to like curb people's usage. Then they're not going to be popular. They won't get reelected, right? So yeah. it's a kind of messed up system in that way. But as for us, like, inshallah, we'll be around for 10, 20, 30 more years. So what are we going to do, and what are we going to go to Allah with in terms of this? Um, yeah. yeah.
I think I could definitely drive less. I mean, I drive every single day. I definitely think I could drive less. Um, you could carpool, for example, I suppose. Like yeah. Like to work, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't really need to drive. The only reason I drive most of my week to work is because of the time I finish work. Like sometimes I'll finish at midnight. Sometimes I finish at four in the morning. Sometimes I finish at seven in the morning. And the last thing I want to do is get on, like wait for a bus or like walk 10 minutes to the bus stop and wait for a bus and then wait for that bus journey. Blah, 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 blah. I'm falling asleep. Um, but once again, like it's there. I mean, I get free buses anyway. So I might as well, you know, that's just, that's a perk of work that I never use. Um, so yeah, I should. However, once again, it's, it's, an, it's just a bit, I feel it's just a bit backwards when the technology is sitting there and it's not being pushed out for people by those that can push it out. Like, I feel like that should be, you know, I don't, I don't, it doesn't equate to me why that isn't an option for, for the government. Like what, well, I understand why it isn't because there's so much invested into fuel, like fossil fuels and stuff. And not only that, but you've got lobbies like, uh, yeah. And you've got, you know, people with shares and stocks and, and you know, they've got a foot in the door when it comes to this kind of stuff. So there, they want to see their investments flourish and they don't want to see them plummet. And Mm. you know, it's crazy, bro, Mm. but green energy is the future, man. Mm. Why do you think, I mean, this is my perception that, Muslims generally are not too interested in this topic. They're, yeah, just not really into it at all. Why do you think that is? I think, I'll argue the opposite, bro. I think Muslims are interested into it on different levels, right? Okay. I think, I think, okay, West, like Muslims in the West here, I think they're quite actively aware. I think if you were to show them something like, like, the, the information and they were exposed to it mm. I think it would hurt it would it would hurt their heart because that's that's the fitra that we have is that we want to look after you know the the planet our last planet Allah's made us over right I think Muslims in maybe quote unquote third world countries or poorer countries they are engaged in it in a different way because they don't want to see their environments physically polluted with litter with rubbish with waste with this and that and I think um, they would also not want all of this you know crap being dumped in their countries and stuff like that and seeing the effects of it but they may not be as um aware of like burning fossil fuels or using old cars or stuff like that like that might not be something in their projection but like i don't i I don't know i think it's a bit of an assumption to say that muslims don't care about it i don't know at what point Mm. i don't know where about is because you know i'm aware you know i i've always seen uh white people with the you know the reusable bags and the this and that right it, it seems to be that, oh, right. it it seems to be part of the white um middle class uh, upper class um culture but I, I really don't feel it's part of the muslim culture let's say in the uk i feel like you would find if you take middle class middle class uh white uh, than any of any muslim you would always find the Muslim is less likely to be. I suppose there is this, there is this apathy of it's the dunya. So I don't care element of it Mm -hmm. that can creep into people's minds. Um, It's something that's crossed my mind, but I don't know how actively it plays its role in people's, you know, Muslim mindset of like, well, it doesn't matter. It's the dunya anyway. It's not here forever. It's meant to be used and, and discarded do you understand what i mean so there is that element that could play on people's minds even if they're not religious it may be a subconscious thing where they're like well i'm not going to be here forever yeah Yeah, as an excuse so you know um it's it's the same with those people that they don't take their portion of the dunya because they believe that it's not it's like when you ask somebody why don't you work hard why don't you work hard in, 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 in the dunya to get your portion of it or to, to be successful? It's like, oh, it's just the dunya anyway. I'm going to be lazy, etc. cetera. So um, it's that element of it. Incorrect understanding, basically, of... Yeah, incorrect. Uh, or laziness. It's just, it's basically trying to use the dean to justify one's yeah, laziness. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think maybe that, you know, a lot of, a lot of let's say, in the UK, the immigrants that from Muslim countries went to the UK, for, for that first generation had bigger worries than thinking of this right then the generation after that they're also kind of in that mindset and so they didn't have this um 
they, they don't have a time to relax to get into these deeper things yeah. and these yeah. more, it's almost like a, uh, I hate to use the word but it's a privileged thing to be able to be stable and relaxed enough that you can think of okay recycling and this and that isn't it it's like it's a very yeah. much uh, thing that middle class people or better can think about also we we a lot of muslims that are you know the minority in their communities also don't want to stick out like they want to just mm. blend in and not keep draw attention to themselves mm. keep their head down and keep it moving yeah, sort of yeah, thing yeah. so like to be at the forefront of that kind of change it takes somebody who's actually a bit more spiritually and, and, and aware and environmentally aware of the impact they're having around them. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I think, but in all honesty, I think if you, if you sat any Muslim down and showed them a documentary or exposed them to, you know, the reality of where our waste goes and what happens to it, I think, yeah, they'd be shocked. And I think, you know, it's just ignorance at the end of the day, not active ignorance. Like they're not trying to hide it away, but a lot yeah, of people yeah. just are blissfully unaware. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I yeah. think, Andy, as with many things, we have to just look at it in terms of what we are able to do and what's feasible for us. Like mm -hmm. you're saying, it's not feasible really for you to not have a car, um, but it is feasible for you to like reuse bags and recycle and this and that. And so as with many things, like we have to think yeah. of, yeah. Yeah. I'll be asked about this. I won't, you know, Allah will actually ask, hold me to account for this and that. And so we have to hold ourselves to account yeah. for Allah. Holds yeah. Us, like uh, account on your See my, 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 my envisioning is like i have a like i go to a sh i go and have a bit a plastic bag right or not your plastic bag like anything bro let's say okay plastic bag i have got it in my hand and when i get to the bin i've got a choice and it always is a choice do you put it in the recycle one or do i put it in this in this refuse one right now i know or i i have it in my head that there's a high likelihood that if i put it in this refuse one this bag could just go somewhere end up on some animal choke it to death or its particles could end up in some animal or fish's stomach and it will die. Yeah. And I've actively, I've actively participated in that process. Yeah. Or I could put this in, you know, there's no guarantee either way what's going to end up with it. But the choice at that point is I'm making a conscious choice which direction I want this to go towards. Yeah. And I don't know. I feel like in my heart, I feel like that's something I'm going to be questioned about. Like I've actively got a choice. So am I going to choose a path that is less likely to harm, you know, the dunya or I'm going to, or put it on the on the side where just you know I'm trying to say. So in my head, I'm like, this is a very very simple uh, opportunity for a good deed to be done, whether you will consider it a good deed or not. Like, I can't see like you know, there's no good. You know, good only gets good back. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's no. I don't see this as being a bad thing at all. I don't see recycling being a bad thing whatsoever. I can yeah. see the negative effects. It actively ruins. Uh, communities wildlife habitats etc the environment whatever this is people these are things and let's let's not just think about it as the wildlife like fish you know the, the effects on fish for example doesn't just stop with the fish it stops with the communities the human beings the muslims around the world that rely on sea life to survive to eat to you know to 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 sell fish to catch mm. fish sell fish to pay for their kids to do you know what i mean the circle of life is crazy in that sense everything's connected yeah. you know when you've got when you've got complete habitats of fish that are disappearing, whether that's from overfishing, whether that's from pollution, whatever, mm. then you've got communities that have relied on, on that sort of, of that habitat and that resource for thousands and thousands of years now suffering because of you being part of a problem. You know, it's crazy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there is, um, you know, some people might think this, you know, when we're discussing it, that there is definitely some level of agenda uh, behind this environmentalism push um, oh, yeah. negative agenda in terms of what, I mean, I, I hear snippets here and there, but one thing that I, you know, comes to mind is, and I think you mentioned it a couple of episodes ago about how, you know, all these uh, Western countries, you know, plus Japan, plus maybe a bit of China, they've all pollute as much as they liked in order to, to get to where they are today and now they're trying to like slow things down when when their economy is slowing down they're, they're trying to point the finger at everyone else yeah, to yeah, slow yeah. down so there's definitely that element and then there's also the element of i think some of these oil companies are trying to uh, either they're trying to reverse the movement towards renewable or they're trying to uh, slow it down enough so that they can get involved in the you know renewable uh, energy economy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's there's a lot going on, but uh, and I think we should we shouldn't be naive about that. We should be aware that you know we're not just 
fully like following the movement wherever people take us like we're doing this ultimately because you know we are responsible for how this world turns out and you know and allah says don't break the balance so that's why we're doing it right we're not doing it because the un told us to or because you know this country said well why are you muslim country polluting the world and we're doing it ultimately that that should be the first reason isn't it mm. no definitely bro definitely i was thinking of like even now the the, the race for electric vehicles in china is really spurring up because mm. They know that the world's pointing at them like, oh, you're a mass polluter and you're the biggest polluter on the planet. But like, if they're racing towards green energy and they're actively aware of that, then fair play to them. Do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think it's still, regardless, I think it still is the future. But I think there's this element of instant gratification that exists in every heart that that pulls, puts us back and stops us from investing in the future in general when it yeah, comes to yeah. like, you know, because really and truthfully climate change, the big bad negatives of it aren't going to really impact me and you. They're going to impact like our kids and our grandkids mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And a lot of people don't like to think that far or don't bother thinking that far. They think oh, I'll leave it to them. Let me get, have my cake now and they can sort it out for themselves later on. But mm -hmm. we as Muslims shouldn't be thinking like that. We need to think a bit more long term. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's how, that's where the, the actual Muslim mindset comes in, isn't it, really? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. thinking about your legacy and your sadaqah jariyah and you're being asked about these things. And even maybe, I don't know, but Neil Bukhari, when he was like um, compiling uh, mm. the, the book of, of Hadith, you know, maybe the people around him, a lot of them knew the Hadith and it was like known, maybe not all of them, but, you know, but what he did in the end was like generations down the line, we're still benefiting from it yeah. now you know yeah, yeah, yeah so that's just one example Sarah obviously Kajeria, bro. obviously we have the hadith of the prophet you know if yom al qiyam is coming you're planting a tree then keep planting it and, exactly uh, about making wudu you know even if you're at a flowing river then don't waste that water and stuff yeah. so yeah it's, it's definitely in our in our tradition for sure man definitely yeah. um and we just got to do whatever is reasonable because uh unlike maybe the the purely uh, logical if you like way of viewing the world i don't think like allah doesn't hold us account for things that we would really struggle to do yeah but maybe an environmentalist would hold the poor accountable for not being able to recycle whatever you know not being able to use uh, transport. Yeah. you know they might be harsh but allah is perfectly just and balanced and so when we're worried about are we doing the right thing we have to think ultimately about what allah will think uh, rather than, you know, whatever organization or whatever, you know? Definitely, bro. So, yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, last thing I wanted to cover is just like, like, do, do you see the, the, yeah, the, the mess on the planet? Like, is it purely like Allah created the physical world and, and the systems and the ecosystem, all how it works and we've impacted that and therefore it's doing its thing. Uh, or do you think it's like part of sins? Like is the sins like exacerbating the problem? Both. Like I said, like I think that for one per for a person to commit a, a particular sin, I think that there's a deviation in their fitra anyway. Mm -hmm. But the side effects of that deviation don't just lead to the sin; they lead to other things. For example, if you're a, a, somebody who's easily, you know, easily taken by your desires and committing sin, then you're also you also have a proponency to be, you know, seeking instant gratification all the time. Because at the end of the day, sin is the most, you know, direct form of instant gratification. Mm -hmm. You are choosing to do something in this world that you could have waited to do better in the next, right? Mm -hmm. So instant gratification is basically, in, in one sense, connected to all sin, whether that's polluting, whether that's mm -hmm. this, whether that's mm -hmm. that. And the disposability nature of it all, mm -hmm. you know, you you commit a sin that actually doesn't have a lasting positive effect on yourself. Whatever that sin is, you know, there's no positive thing that lasts that long. And because of that, you haven't instilled in your heart this patience of waiting things out or using things to the fullest or, or um, you know, being grateful for what you already have, you know, whatever that sin is. So in that sense... You know, when you when you when you feel nothing about you know throwing or wasting or whatever, then that I think that's a personality trait. Then that then infects everything else in your life. Um, 
So yeah, actually, I think if you know, if I think of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if I if I was to visualize the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam living amongst us now, I'd visualize him as a minimalist with that, with not you know not a consumerist. Like I visualize him as somebody who who uses who uses what he needs and doesn't go into excess. Like that's just me trying to visualize a religious person, a, 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 the best Muslim I can think walking on this earth right now would be somebody who who is is. Yeah, like it's not wasteful, for example, who uses what, he, what they need. Who, if they have more than one thing or they have something that they, 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 they have broken, for example, they will try and repair it. They will try and pass it on to somebody who needs it. You know, they'd be charitable with stuff that you know, they have. So I wouldn't picture somebody being someone who's just constantly buying more and more and more or, you know, um, balanced person that is very conscious of the impact that they have on the communities around them and the the the, the environment around them etc yeah 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 agreed man one thing i'm thinking of is maybe like i don't have many clothes anyway but i might do the whole minimalist thing of having like just like three tops three trousers and good ones but but don't allow myself to have more than x amount or whatever um, I think mm. that makes sense, you know. I remember mm. Hamza Yusuf saying that he only gets, uh, only wears tailored clothes. So he doesn't make sure he doesn't have anything from sweatshops. And, you know, uh, I think he was saying like he doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't have many clothes. He just has a few very good handmade clothes, you know. And uh, I like that as well. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. That's a cool concept to have, actually. Because it's always, it keeps this balance as well. Like one thing I've realized is like, for example, everything's connected when it comes to like fluctuations. Like you can be constant and it shows. But if you like, imagine you weigh, you weigh yourself like every week and you have like constant fluctuations in your weight, mm. um, which is something I realized like I was having fluctuations all, like from month to month. Like, mm. And I realized that's got a lot to say about how I'm living my life. Mm. Like, if I'm eating a lot one month and I'm not eating the next month, then it shows that this behavior mm. that is all connected, like everything's connected, bro. If you're constantly focused on one goal, which is the afterlife, yeah, in, in general, you're constantly focused on, on your akhirah, you're constantly focused on that, then then you should re theoretically have this constant sort of, this mm. constance about you. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. That you're, or a trajectory where you're just on the incline of improvement, right? But if you're volatile, then you're going to have your bad times, your good times, your bad, do you understand? And then you're, that's going to impact you more. The, mm -hmm. the difference is what we always say about like, Iman goes up and down, right? But you, you only ever want it to go down a little bit and uh, like in increments, but steadily on average, you always want it going up like that, like a graph that's going up. But obviously, like there's going to be a few volatile moments, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be that person that it's like literally boom, you're down for months and then you're up for for like a week and then down for months and then like really, really volatile sort of stuff. Like I'm just thinking of the stock market now, but that kind of thing. Right. But that means that the, the impact that it has on you, your, everything that you do is going to be immense, bro. Like, and that's one thing I was thinking, subhanAllah, like my weight was very volatile because my mind was very volatile, which mm. showed that it was impacting my behavior, which showed that how much good and khair was I doing? How focused was I on my goals? How focused was I on the akhirah? Mm. That kind of thing. And then it all comes back to it. But if you constantly got this thing of like, okay, the pattern of, okay, you know, I'm going to read the Quran this many times. I'm going to attend this many duros and this is going to be the constant. And then that, that way I'm always on that sirat and mustaqim, you know? So if I'm bouncing a little bit, then it's not that, that bad as long as I keep it within acceptable limits, you know what yes. I mean? And what is my standard and what is the bar that I'm going to set and where am I not going to transgress? And, you know, and that's it. Yeah. It affects everything. It mm. affects everything. Yeah. 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 Jazakallah khairan, man. Um, let's wrap it up, I think. Yes, uh, right. Unless you got anything else to add. No, I need to pray Maghrib now. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, uh, you can just go to mindheistpodcast.com. You can find out, couple ways to contact us there and anonymously or not and uh yeah make sure you check out previous episodes like i said episode 90 is really good episode 79 is really good um and whatever topic you're interested in uh yeah subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik shadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaikum wa wabarakatuh everyone what's up